this is Jack Ryan, and welcome to another session of the Legal and Liability Risk Management Institute's ongoing law enforcement training. Hey, I want to talk to you today about the restraint process. Uh, you know, uh, with a lot of things going on uh, in the United States in law enforcement, uh, particularly these last couple of weeks, this is being done in 2020, um, in June. And um, so we've had a recent case in Minneapolis that has really brought some of the restraint process issues to the forefront. I want to talk to you first about the studies because that's where there's um, some controversy, if you will. There was a study done many, many years ago by uh, Dr. Ray, and Dr. Ray concluded that positional asphyxia uh, could in fact compromise breathing, could in fact lead to death, and then if law, law enforcement during the restraint process uh, cause positional asphyxia, then ultimately they may in fact uh, have caused a person's death. Now, I will tell you there's a lot of trainers, even over the last couple of weeks, I've heard some trainers on some uh, national uh, programs, national news items, uh, say that positional asphyxia has been debunked. Well, I'll tell you exactly where that comes from. That comes from a case that was a federal district court case. And that's important because federal district court cases really don't create any precedent for law enforcement. But there was a, a case out of uh, the county of San Francisco, and this goes back a number of years, as I said, where uh, Dr. Ray was hired uh, by the plaintiff to testify to positional asphyxia as having caused the death of Mr. Price. The county of San Francisco actually hired a Dr. Newman and Dr. Newman was hired specifically to basically try to redo Ray's studies, look at whether a person uh, after exercise has lower oxygen levels. So after a fight, that would be comparable. So he would have people exercise and he would, he would test that. And he, he looked at different uh, methods of compromising oxygen levels. And Dr. Newman concluded that, that really uh, that Dr. Ray's studies were incorrect. Um, Dr. Ray at trial conceded some points. Uh, it was a bench trial. Uh, that, that becomes important as well. Um, so it's a, it's a single federal court case in federal district court that has no binding precedent that a lot of trainers cite back to, a lot of articles cite back to, to say that positional asphyxia has been debunked. So I want to examine that today. I want to I wanna actually ask that question. And I think one of the things we should recognize, I want to tell you this right from the outset, is that the Ninth Circuit, which obviously covers California, uh, kind of rejected the holding of the Price case. Um, not completely, but they, they, but they did in the Drummond case, it's Drummond versus An Anaheim, uh, indicate that positional asphyxia was in fact uh, problematic. I'd like to start off uh, by reviewing a case uh, because I think uh, that will help us uh, when we review some video. Uh, it's about 10 years ago now, uh, but it's an actual case. And then I'll talk about how the different uh, doctors uh, looked at this particular event. 3.47 p.m. 35 seconds, September 9, 2, 0, 1, 0. Hi, this is Ariane Jackson. I am a... Uh, I work at the downtown Minneapolis YMCA. Mm -hmm. Apparently, my manager on duty, she told me to call the cops. I don't know what the reason is. But there, I take it there was an incident between a little boy and a grown man, so I don't know if that's what it's about. But, yeah, she just told me to call the cops. He's right here. Do you want to talk to him or on the phone? Hello? Hello? Hi, my name is Courtney Campbell, and I'm the fitness director here. We have a gentleman in the building. He doesn't know who he is, he doesn't know his name, he doesn't know my name, uh, he doesn't know where he's at, but he has been harassing a, a juvenile, like a 10-year-old, 11-year-old boy, and we need to get this gentleman out of our building, and he's not complying. Okay, where is he at now? He's on our sixth floor basketball court right now. He, he looks dangerous. How so? Uh, just his eyes look really glassed over. His speech is slurred. Um, I, I, I it, he, he doesn't look like he's a, a safe gentleman. Your I, name? My name is Courtney. I am the fitness director here. 
39th Street, right? That is correct, sir. We'll be out there as soon as we can. Thank you very much. You bye bye. bye. Should we tear them? Yeah. I've never done it before. Okay. Stop, all right? You know what? Sure, stop. All right. Get out of the ground.
Jerry. Corner. Corner. Oh, I don't think he's there. David Smith, the, the man in this video, uh, died as a result of his encounter with law enforcement in Minneapolis back in 2010. The medical examiner, uh, Dr. Andrew Baker, who did the autopsy, and, and again, remember, the medical examiner was not plaintiff's expert, he was not defense expert, he was simply the uh, county's medical examiner who did the autopsy, so really had no uh, position in, in any lawsuit or anything like that. Uh, Dr. Andrew Baker concluded that uh, David Smith died of, uh, obviously his heart stopped as a result of uh, his encounter with the police, but cited to the fact that his death was caused by mechanical asphyxiation, uh, the weight on top of, uh, of David Smith. And, and essentially, Dr. Baker, in talking about this, talked about the lungs have to open and close like a bellows, you know, like a fireplace bellows, and, and when you have weight on your back, uh, they were unable to do so. Now, again, when the, when the case progresses into a lawsuit, there are doctors hired by the plaintiff. Uh, Dr. Bodden was hired by the plaintiff. Another doctor was hired by the defense. And they had dueling um, theories uh, about whether or not this was a compression asphyxia, mechanical uh, asphyxiation, or compression asphyxia case. But I think that's important for law enforcement to know is that there's going to be doctors on both sides. One's going to say, uh, hey, this, uh, you know, positional asphyxia, compression asphyxia, mechanical asphyxiation can't cause death. And, and then there's going to be doctors on the other side that say it absolutely can cause death. So I think one of the things that law enforcement has to consider is to pull themselves out of that debate and bring this to a force issue and a restraint issue. Is the use of force, is the restraint reasonable? And if so, how do we ensure that it, that it becomes reasonable and take ourselves away from this medical, this scientific debate that continues today? You know, I think even if you look at one of the, the lead studies on this done by Dr. Chan and, and uh, Gary Vilke and, and there's others, um, they recognize that there's limitations, that they can't possibly duplicate all of the um, issues in a laboratory study that are taking place in a street encounter with somebody who may be on drugs, somebody who may be uh, panicking because of an arrest, somebody who may be panicking because of the encounter with the police. So all of these other issues that may come into play can't be duplicated in a laboratory study. So again, why would law enforcement want to get involved in that debate? The, the better issue is to say, okay, how do we restrain somebody? And what steps do we take as soon as restraint is accomplished um, uh, to, to act reasonably with respect to the use of force analysis, which falls back to the Graham versus Connor test. Um, and remember, all uses of force, whether it be putting weight on somebody, whether it be even handcuffing somebody, have to be reasonable. And law enforcement considers the three-part test from Graham. How serious is the offense? What's the physical threat posed by the subject to the officer or anybody else? at the time the force is used. So again, physical threat at the time the force is used uh, would have to take into account in cases like this that the subject is already handcuffed and maybe the physical threat has ended. So how do we continue to use 
a degree of force, uh, you know, so uh, that's going to play into this as, as we uh, uh, complete our journey today. Um, and then is the subject actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest by flight? If law enforcement has um, subdued the individual, and they're restrained, they're not going anywhere, then that takes that element out of, out of it as well. So again, these are all things we will consider uh, as we go through these materials uh, because there's certainly more to go. In light of the fact that most trainers use the price case uh, in Dr. Newman's study to undercut the idea that uh, positional asphyxia is, a, is an issue for law enforcement, I think it's important to look at the Drummond case, Drummond versus Anaheim. Uh, Mr. Drummond, over the course of a couple of days, was having some mental health issues. He was off medication, couldn't afford to buy the medication. Uh, on the first day, um, law enforcement was called. It was determined that at that point that he was not a danger to himself. Uh, his girlfriend, Mr. Drummond's girlfriend, thought that law enforcement was pretty unprofessional on that call. Um, the following day, some neighbors called because they, they were afraid he was going to run into traffic and, and a number of other issues. And, and law enforcement responded and found him in the parking lot of a convenience store. Uh, some, some bystanders uh, described what occurred. They said, you know, after the officers decided they were going to take him into custody, one of the officers tackled uh, Mr. Drummond to the ground. Um, they were almost immediately able to get him handcuffed, and um, and then uh, he was still on his stomach, and the officers remained on top of him. Uh, at least one officer on his back, another officer um, alleged to be on his neck, and uh, so the, the the case goes forward, and and the plaintiff. Um, you know, brings a, a lawsuit. The defense in that case, uh, the city of Anaheim, one of the things they raise is the, the issues from the Price case. They say, hey, look, in Price it was determined that positional asphyxia really doesn't kill anybody, and these people are all, all relying on Dr. Ray's studies, and, uh, and it's wrong. So what, what ends up happening is uh, the court, they don't outright reject the Price case, but they point out that Price was a, a bench decision by a judge who weighted most of the uh, uh, evidence in favor of law enforcement. Um, it's obviously non-binding. And, and the court says something. They said, you know, even the, the common person knows that if you put so, too much weight on somebody's back, it's, it's going to impair their breathing. So essentially, you know, the, the idea that, that uh, positional asphyxia and mechanical asphyxiation was debunked uh, in that Price case uh, is, is really a, a dangerous proposition, as I mentioned before, for law enforcement to follow. And I think it's, that's why it's so important to look at the follow-up and look at some more current cases um, as we go forward. So we're going to take a look. I, I just want to point out a couple of cases where some experts uh, were challenged, and, and I'm going to do one on each side. One, an expert um, who wants to testify that positional asphyxia does not uh, compromise breathing. And the second one, an expert who is going to testify that it does compromise breathing. Just to establish the contrasting views, uh, first look at Carlock versus Williamson, which involves the death of a pretrial detainee uh, in a jail in Illinois. Um, the defendants, uh, so the jail uh, defendants, uh, they were going to use Mark Kroll, uh, who was going to testify uh, specifically that there is no risk to face down restraint, even if weight is applied to an individual's back. The plaintiff tried to exclude that testimony, obviously because uh, they were trying to show that the death was caused by officers putting weight on uh, uh, Mr. Carlock's back. The court denied the plaintiff's motion uh, to exclude Kroll. They found that Kroll was sufficiently qualified, his testimony sufficiently reliable, and his testimony sufficiently relevant. Uh, the court noted that, uh, you know, he, uh, with respect to prone restraint, uh, Kroll had relied on peer-reviewed articles and authorities related to positional asphyxia, restraint position, and prone restraint. The court noted that the effects of prone restraint on respiration has been tested and subjected to peer review, and that while the scientific evidence on positional asphyxia was divided, the evidentiary rules were broad enough to allow uh, testimony uh, such as uh, 
Mark Kroll was going to give in this particular case. The contrasting point comes from another case, Good versus uh, South Haven. Uh, Kelly Good brought a complaint against a number of police officers and medical uh, defendants, alleging that her husband, Troy Williams' death was caused by positional asphyxia and his placement in a prone maximum restraint. One of the medical defendants, Dr. Oliver, filed a motion to exclude the plaintiff's expert's testimony. Uh, the plaintiff's expert was going to testify that, in fact, prone restraint, maximal restraint, uh, does compromise breathing. So just the very opposite of what uh, Mark Kroll was testifying to in the Carlock case. Um, within this motion, the, the uh, defendant Oliver made a blatant objection that there's no scientific basis for the assertion that prone maximal restraint causes positional asphyxia. The court disagreed with Oliver's position for a number of reasons. The court noted that a 2007 study upon which Oliver relied did not include subjects like Troy Williams, who had a history of uh, cardiac and pulmonary problems. The court also noted that uh, none of the studies uh, done by anybody replicated the conditions in the field, including psychological and physical stresses associated with pursuit by a law enforcement official, struggle, or trauma. The court also noted that in this case, um, Troy Williams was in maximum restraint for a long period of time. In fact, the facts pattern in the case say he was in maximum restraint for an hour and a half uh, between law enforcement and the medical uh, folks uh, once he got to the hospital. So again, um, the court allowed this uh, uh, expert to testify that prone restraint, maximum restraint, positional asphyxia does compromise breathing. So we see that there's two contrasting views on the medical side, which is one of the reasons why I say law enforcement has to remove themselves from that debate. It's clear from the cases that the courts recognize that prone restraint, prone restraint with pressure, uh, positional asphyxia can be an unreasonable use of force. And there's a number of even recent cases that establish that. Um, that's why um, I, I think when we look at a, a, a video like we saw in Minneapolis uh, in the uh, Floyd case, I think uh, it's pretty apparent even law enforcement uh, is highly critical of what they see. Uh, i just give you some examples. McHugh versus City of Bangor, Maine is a good example. Um, in this case, the officers are trying to take Mr. McHugh, who's acting erratically, into protective custody. They believe he had used bath salts and, and uh, he needed to be uh, taken into custody for his own well-being. Kind of the emergency uh, committal type of uh, situation. So uh, they uh, end up in a, in a struggle with, with Mr. McHugh. Initially his hands were under his body. They can't get his hands. There's a taser deployment. After the taser deployment, they're able to get his hands handcuffed, and, and then there's a struggle to get his legs under control. They get his legs controlled. There's still a little bit of a struggle, and they actually use a uh, canine leash, uh, a dog leash, uh, to uh, attach his wrist to his ankles uh, to uh, prevent any further struggle. The issue is after that point, and again, there's, there is some controversy as to how long after that point, but the, the um, facts in the case would indicate that two big officers uh, continued to put pressure, one kneeling on Mr. McHugh's back, one kneeling on his neck, after he's finally secured both hands, legs, and this dog leash. Uh, the court said at the time this event occurred that it was clearly established, that it, was, it should be clear to any officer that pressure on somebody's back uh, in prone restraint can compromise breathing and cause serious harm. Um, so the court says that was clearly established. They actually cited the Weigel case, which is out of the 10th Circuit, which involved the uh, uh, state police uh, in that case. So again, they, they, they cite back to other cases, older cases, but uh, I think McHugh was like a 2016 case. So, you know, this is, this is not, uh, remember, uh, trainers have argued the Price case, which was in 1998, debunked all these theories about asphyxia, uh, when in fact these these uh, uh, cases still find that uh, these issues can be unreasonable force when used by a law enforcement officer. In fact, McHugh, in the case the court points out, the First Circuit does, that uh, any officer should know, even without formal training, that continued uh, exerted pressure on somebody's back while they're in a prone restraint uh, can cause serious harm. So again, that's just one example.
We'll look at a couple more. A case from the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit has some fairly typical kind of facts, at least with respect to the stop. Um, the case is Martin versus City of Broadview Heights. In that case, officers in the middle of the night, I think it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, they have the uh, naked guy running around acting erratically. Uh, they try to uh, take custody of him, probably for his own well-being. Um, at some point, uh, there are uh, at least three officers present. Uh, there is a struggle. Officers deliver compliance strikes, uh, knees and, and hands. Uh, then officers get um, Mr. Martin secure, and it's at least alleged that officers put pressure on him and keep him in a prone position for a period of time. And by the time, and that's after he's secured, and then uh, after that point, when they pick him up, uh, he dies, uh, you know, goes limp and dies. And, and you know, this is, uh, in many of these cases, there's a typical set of facts. And then the criticism is that not that officers didn't have the right to get somebody restrained. I, I, I will say in this case, the court says that the, uh, the body strikes and, and whatnot may have been uh, unreasonable as well. But putting that aside, in many of these cases, it's not that the um, restraining the person uh, is in any way unreasonable. It's the manner of restraint and then what occurs after restraint is accomplished that the officers didn't immediately move the person into a position that facilitates breathing. And that's really what uh, the court looks at in this case. And the Sixth Circuit says in this case that it's, it's clearly established uh, that officers should know that once somebody is restrained, that continued pressure uh, on the back uh, may be an unreasonable use of force. As I said, in this case, the court also looked at the hard hand strikes, the knee strikes, and, and the uh, uh, fist strikes as, as potentially being unreasonable as well. Uh, and, and again, they did apply the Graham three-part test, citing to the fact that, um, you know, the situation with Martin was minor, um, that he didn't seem to pose any physical threat, um, and that it, essentially because it's well-being, he's not really actively resisting or attempt to, to evade an arrest by flight. Uh, so again, there's a, an example from the Sixth Circuit. We'll take a look at a couple more uh, before we move on. It should probably be recognized that many of these cases do involve persons who are having erratic behavior, uh, maybe mental health breakdown or otherwise. This next case, Birch versus City of New York, is, is that type of set of facts, almost like the last one. Uh, in this case, uh, Mr. Streeter is taken to the uh, uh, a hospital, and um, it's a mental health uh, facility. But he's then uh, transported to another hospital because he's got a high, highly uh, blood pressure, really highly elevated. And uh, on the way, he bails out of the, uh, the ambulance or the rescue, what have you. And that uh, prompts a response of the New York City Police Department. Now, it's alleged by the plaintiffs that by the time uh, the NYPD gets there, Mr. Streeter is already uh, on the ground and, and restrained. As, and again, this is a plaintiff's version of events uh, that the court looks at. Uh, but then it's alleged that, you know, he's restrained and then he's held down by two officers. Uh, again, weight on his back, weight on his neck. Um, so much so that his, his nose is bleeding. Uh, he's got dirt uh, in his mouth. He's got dirt in his eyes. And um, obviously, those are things that are determined later on. Uh, but again, pressure and prone restraint. Uh, there's a witness who, uh, uh, you know, independent witness who says that they hear Mr. Streeter saying that he can't breathe, held down for a long period of time. Uh, and obviously, it's another case where uh, he ends up deceased as a result of this uh, event or this interaction with the New York City Police Department. Uh, again, this is another case uh, where the court looks at it and says, hey, look, you know, it's clearly established that uh, prone restraint uh, with significant pressure on the person for an extended period of time uh, does compromise breathing. Any officer should know that. So the court denies even, even qualified immunity to the officers. This is an important one that I'm going to cover in another session, too. The court also points out that there's a duty to intervene 
uh, by other officers. And again, we'll come back to that uh, when we look at that Minneapolis video. But again, uh, you know, uh, indication that there is, in fact, a duty to intervene uh, by other officers who see this prone restraint uh, with pressure on the body for, for a period of time. Because, uh, again, there is this opportunity to intervene as, as time passes by. So, again, Birch is just another example from another uh, jurisdiction. Uh, the cases go on and on. Um, so, you know, one of the things, and this is why I keep saying, I've said this several times, is that law enforcement has to pull themselves back from the debate on the medical issue of what prone restraint does or doesn't do. Um, to me, that's irrelevant um, because what's relevant is whether or not the officer's actions are going to be found reasonable in terms of the United States Constitution. That's the issue that we've got to be concerned about not whether or not the, the medical folks disagree or agree about cause of death after the fact. Well, we've looked at a number of cases where uh, individuals have been compressed for a long period of time. I think a, a good case uh, out of uh, the Middle District of Georgia is, is a, a good one to take a look at. Uh, in Dixter versus Pearson, uh, Mr. Dixter was held down initially for 20 seconds uh, with a deputy putting uh, pressure on his neck while they accomplished handcuffing. Um, once he was handcuffed and searched, uh, it, you know, the court notes that he was held down for an additional 17 seconds. So now we've got 20 seconds pre-handcuffing, only 17 seconds post-handcuffing and secure. But the, what's interesting about the case is, you know, he, he's ultimately taken to the hospital, he dies, he can't be revived. and. Um, when the court analyzes the case, they say it was clearly established uh, by the date of this event happening that the second uh, uh, compression, the one after handcuffing and searching, uh, didn't have any uh, justifiable law enforcement purpose uh, because he was already secured. He, was, he was, wasn't a threat at that point. He wasn't an escape risk uh, because he's already secure and whatnot. So, so again, uh, even 17 seconds, the court said, uh, was an unreasonable use of force uh, in this particular case. Uh, this one's interesting because on the duty to intervene, which we'll come back to, as I said in another session, on the duty to intervene, uh, the court said because this happened fairly quickly, it was only 17 seconds, uh, that they would not hold the other officers liable for the failure to intervene in this particular event. Hey, and looking at the law and best practice with respect to uh, restraint, handcuffing process, and on this particular issue, um, we recognize in law enforcement, and we train all the time, that, uh, you know, officers may need to move a person uh, to a prone position in order to accomplish handcuffing, uh, particularly a person that's actively resisting. So, again, this doesn't change that because it, it may be necessary to get them in a prone position to do that. And in fact, officers uh, can reasonably uh, use body weight uh, to restrain a person so that handcuffing can be accomplished. One of the things we have to recognize, though, is that in doing so, there's certain areas of the body that we should always be trying to avoid. You know, um, again, the courts have been very critical of officers putting any kind of body weight on a person's neck. So obviously, um, the neck is an area that we should be avoiding. Uh, when we do um, any kind of uh, uh, body stabilization. The center of the back, when we go back to even the, the first case, the David Smith case, um, that was a case where there was mechanical asphyxiation as a result of an officer putting pressure under the scapula in the center of the back. Uh, uh, so again, there's areas that we should avoid, even the head. I mean, uh, you, know, the, the is, uh, you know, every so often I'll see a, a video, uh, I'll be working on a case, uh, uh, that I get involved in, and I'll see a video of an officer uh, actually putting pressure on the subject's head. Uh, in most cases, it doesn't uh, help complete the stabilization. Um, it can cause significant injury, and it's, uh, you know, those kinds of cases have been highly criticized by both courts and juries uh, when they get to a lawsuit. So again, what areas might you do? Certainly the area around the buttocks, uh, the hips, uh, uh, those areas where it's not going to in any way uh, put pressure on the chest cavity, uh, you know, uh, shoulder. Uh, there's an awful lot of suggestion, there's an awful lot of training on this that uh, you use one leg uh, 
in order to use stabilization and you keep the other leg on the ground and that way you don't have full body weight on the individual. So again, these are things that you can do from the standpoint of stabilization. I think the other piece of this is you have to take a look uh, at what you do as soon as uh, the person is secured. And, and what do I mean by that? As soon as you have a situation where the person is no longer a threat uh, because you've accomplished restraint, uh, whatever form that may take, then you've got to get the person either on their side or in an upright position that facilitates breathing. A lot of departments call it the rescue position. It's something that's been trained for years and years that a person on their stomach is maybe in a compromised position. Is it always going to be? Are there people that disagree? Of course there are. Uh, but, but again, we want to take ourselves out of that debate and we want to put ourselves in the best position to uh, protect the, the person that we're just uh, restraining. Uh, so how do we do that? One, get them off their stomach. Um, certainly us get off of them. Uh, get them off their stomach and get them into a position which facilitates breathing, which many trainers have identified as either on their side, seated upright, or in a straight upright position. There's simply no way to discuss these issues without talking about the death of George Floyd, which may have a long-lasting impact on law enforcement operations. You, you circle it, like in a jiu-jitsu move, bro. You try, you trapped him. He's breathing right there, bro. Like you don't think that what it is, bro? You don't think nobody understands that shit right there, bro? I train at the academy, bro. That's some bullshit, bro. Right? That's bullshit, bro. That's bullshit, bro. You, you fucking stopping his breathing right there, bro. Okay, he's talking. He's talking, bro. But you could get him off the ground. You've been a bum right now. You could get him off the ground, bro. You could get him off the ground. You've been a bum right now. He enjoying that. He enjoying that shit. He enjoying that shit. He a fucking bum, bro. He enjoying that shit right now, bro. 
You could have fucking put him in the car by now, bro. He's not resisting arrest or nothing. You enjoying it? Look at you. Your body language explains it. You fucking bum. Bro, get the fuck off of him. It's the whites. They love what? the Mets. No, I already know that, bro. I train with half of these bum ass dudes at the academy, bro. You know that's bogus right now, bro. You know it's bogus. You can't even look at me like a man because you a bum, bro. He's not even resisting arrest right now, bro. His nose is bleeding. You fucking stopping his breathing right now, bro. You think that's cool? That's what You think that's, that's cool really though, not. right? What's your right. what's your oh, what, oh man, what's your badge number, bro? You think Honestly. that's cool right now, bro? You call the police You think that's cool though, bro? You're a bum, bro. You're you're a bum for that. You're a bum for that, bro. You can't you getting mad. You just sitting there stopping his breathing right Look now. You about to go out fuck? right now, bro. Look at him. So get off of him now. What is wrong with you? Like what the fuck? He got made. He got made. You're a fucking bum. 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 You're a no, bro, look at him. He's check, not check responsive right yeah, now, good. bro. Yeah, check for a pulse. Bro, are you serious? You're going to just let him keep here with that on Let me see a pulse. Is he breathing right now? Check his pulse. have this conversation. Check his pulse. Okay. Check his pulse, Tao. Tao, check his pulse. Tao, check his pulse, bro. Bro, check his pulse, bro. You bogus, bro. You bogus. Don't do drugs, bro. What is that? What do you think that is? You so you call what he doing okay? Get back You call what he doing okay? You call, you call what you do, you call what he doing okay, bro. Are you really a firefighter? Yes, I am from Minneapolis. Bro, you, 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 you call, you think that's okay? Check his pulse. Check his right now. check his pulse. Get back in the Check, the man ain't moved yet, bro. The man ain't moved yet, bro. Where, where? Minneapolis. Bro, you're a bum, bro. You're a bum, bro. You're definitely a bum, bro. Tell me what it is. Tell me what his pulse is right now. Check the pulse. Bro, he has not moved, not one he's time. Just, he's bro. off. He's off track right now. He's but it, bro, go deep. back in the store, bro. You don't understand. No, no, no. Bro. I'm the reason. Under, okay, that's cool. Go back in the store, bro. Go back in the store, bro. He's not fucking I moving. That. I see that, bro. I'm, bro, I'm, I'm trying to help y'all out. Bro, you don't need to help What's me out, bro. I know your parents. I know everybody that owns the store. You don't need to help me to fuck out, bro. He's not fucking moving right now, bro. I just saw that, man. Bro, he was just moving I'm, when I walked up here. And I know, and then that he, he they, bro, they did that to him. You just got out. You just got back out here, bro. I've been watching it the bro, whole time. You just got back you out here, bro. Bro, he doesn't have a bro. He's not fucking moving. No, so, did they fucking kill him, bro? Bro, did they bro, just kill him what is you 1087, bro? You're a oh bum, bro. Or 987, bro? You're a bum. First thing you want to grab is your mace, cause you scared, bro. Scared of fucking minorities. You're fucking bum, bro. Like, bro, three minutes, bro. He's not he fucking moving. Bro, he's not even fucking moving. Get off of his fucking neck, bro. Get off of his neck. Bro, look at that, bro. Are you serious, bro? Are you serious? And you gonna keep your, you gonna keep, you gonna keep your, your thing on your neck? Yeah, bitch. Bro, it's, bro, I barely touched me like that, dude. I swear I'll stop the fuck out of both of y'all. I didn't want to call the ambulance. Bro, he's, not, he's just gonna let him keep his hand on his neck, bro. You're a bitch, bro. Tao, you gonna keep? You gonna let him keep that like that? You gonna let him kill that man in front of you, bro? Huh? Huh? Like what? Bro, he's not even fucking moving right now, bro. He's not even fucking mouth. This is what it is. We gotta deal with this shit. Bro, they're not gonna help us, bro. Get on Right? He black. They don't care. Nine eighty seven. If it ain't they people, they don't care, bro. You gonna just sit there with your knee on his neck, bro? You a gro you a gro you a real man for that, bro? He ain't handcuffed, bro. Just you a real man, bro. You a real man, bro. I trained with these guys. The fact that you guys are checking his pulse and doing compressions if he needs that, you guys are on another level. Oh my god, bro. Okay, they just dragging him like, come on now. Yeah, and I have your name tag, bitch. That's not very professional. It don't matter. So what? Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech, folks. Back on the street. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. I got this all on camera. Watch out. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. You touched him. You went to him. So shut up. You went to him. Y'all always trying to start something. Don't ever touch me, bro. I ain't said a word. Have a nice night.
He's fucking dead, bro. I can hold that. I can hold I appreciate you. You're wrong, You're wrong, that, bro. They both get shredded. You know that, bro. You're shit up. You know that, bro. What's that badge number? You know that, bro. 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 Yeah, 987, you just killed that nigga, bro. You just Y'all just really him, just killed that man. You just really killed that man, bro. And if he not he dead, he really close to death. Hey, as we look at the video of the uh, encounter between George Floyd that led to his death and the Minneapolis officers, uh, I don't know of a single police officer, a single police trainer, a single police expert who uh, uh, does anything but criticize uh, what they see in that video. What do we see in the video? I, I think there's a number of items that uh, uh, we do see, and then we can start to apply some, some principles to those. One, uh, you know, there's, there's two videos. There's a surveillance video. There may be more at this point, but there's been two that have been publicly aired. Uh, and the first one shows Mr. Floyd right after he is apprehended. He's in handcuffs, and he's unsteady but seems somewhat compliant. Then the next video we see is the bystander video. Um, that's, that's the detailed video that we just watched uh, that's been published and, and publicly put out everywhere and uh, certainly is, is problematic and, and so concerning and has led to such a, a major issue for law enforcement around the country. Um, but I think there's some things that I would point out in the video that I see, uh, one, uh, you know, as the officer is kneeling on uh, Mr. Floyd's neck, uh, if you watch the video closely, you can see that there's another officer on Mr. Floyd as well. They're out of view most of the time, but uh, a couple of times that viewpoint comes uh, on a different angle to the car, and, and there's uh, certainly an officer on the lower body. So, you know, that's, again, uh, another issue that he is well controlled at that point. Uh, even if there was resistance that was not captured. Um, there is no ongoing struggle, um, and certainly Mr. Floyd is saying that he can't breathe and, and appears to be in physical distress. The other thing I notice is that, you know, it, it, whenever we're dealing with somebody in this act of resistance, we're, even if we're stabilizing them, we're also using our hands to try to control them. Uh, we see the officer's hands are on his thighs, um, he's almost in a, a relaxed position as he continues to kneel on Mr. Floyd's neck. And we also see uh, something that we're going to talk about at length in another session. We also see uh, at least one officer, it's clear, is, is not doing anything to intervene uh, in what is clear to law enforcement around the country, uh, unreasonable, unreasonable behavior uh, in the method of restraint. I also uh, notice um, the officer's feet and I noticed that both feet are um, off the ground or at least weighted off the ground uh, which would indicate a, a more significant uh, degree of uh, pressure uh, because obviously as as you take the weight off your feet then um, obviously your full body weight is on the person. If we start applying the Graham three-part test to this you know uh, from what we know and again some of this is all from media reports so it's it's hard to uh, decipher, but it, the 911 call, as I listen to it, uh, that's been put out publicly, would indicate that the store owner indicated that Mr. Floyd may have tried to pass a phony bill in the past, so not even then, and that he's drunk, and that he's in his car, and that he won't leave the area, uh, those kinds of things. There's a lot of that in the uh, the audio of the 911 call, so it's it's questionable whether there's any crime committed, um, certainly questionable whether or not uh, the officers would need to investigate further to determine if a crime's even been committed here. So from a seriousness of offense perspective, um, the first prong of, Gra uh, of Graham, uh, this is, doesn't seem to be very serious. Uh, does he pose a physical threat to the officers or anybody else? Well, certainly not by the time we see the bystander video. Um, when we see the bystander video, it's clear that he's already been handcuffed. Uh, it's clear that there's, we can see three officers at the scene, one of whom's not 
assisting at all uh, and not intervening at all. Uh, one who's got his hands on his thighs and is kneeling on, on Mr. Uh, uh, Floyd's neck. Um, and then another officer who's also restraining him uh, down below that's very difficult to see but is seen at some points in the video. So is there an immediate physical threat to anybody? No, there's not. Um, is he actively resisting? No, uh, we don't see any active resistance on the video. Is he attempting to evade arrest by flight? No, uh, we don't see any of that. The other thing is, you know, uh, bothersome to me is, you know, and, and the courts say this, you know, the courts say in a couple of those cases that we went over, that even the common person knows that pressure on a person may compromise their breathing, particularly on the neck or the back. And, um, and in this case, the, the citizens are, are saying, hey, he's having trouble breathing. Hey, his nose is bleeding. Hey, uh, you know, get off him. Um, so even the citizens recognize that there may be danger here. Now, that's not to say, because I know somebody's going to call me on this, uh, you know, that's not to say that the cause of death is going to come out to be, um, or, or experts aren't going to, uh, are going to disagree as to what the actual cause of death is. Now, that's a different issue. That's the debate. Uh, again, as I said, law enforcement's got to take itself out of the debate because we have to use reasonable force. Uh, whether or not it causes the death or not is not that doesn't make it reasonable or unreasonable based on the the, the the end result What makes it reasonable or unreasonable is how serious was the offense? What was the physical threat at the time the force was used was the subject actively resisting or attempting to evade arrest by flight? And when we see the cases apply these principles, we went over a number of them. They say hey look prolonged uh, compression on the neck or the back after uh, the person's been restrained uh, can be an unreasonable use of force. I think with the length of time in this one, uh, with no uh, no indication of active resistance, no indication of a physical threat at the time, I don't think anybody can say that this is a reasonable use of force. So again, I think we've got a, some takeoffs uh, from uh, this, this training. One, um, yes, we may have to put people in a prone position to accomplish handcuffing, uh, we have to have ourselves in a position of tactical advantage at, at times, so that's, that still has to happen. Uh, when we do that and we're going to use any kind of pressure to stabilize them while we accomplish handcuffing, we've got to stay away from the neck, we've got to stay away from the center of the back, um, and, and certainly uh, I would say stay away from the head as well. Um, when um, handcuffing is accomplished, then we have to take steps to immediately get off them and put them in a position uh, that facilitates breathing and we've identified those positions as upright uh, or at least on their side. And again, we saw a case where 17 seconds was too long, so that has to be immediate. Hey, thanks for joining us in another session of the Legal and Liability Risk Management Institute's Law Enforcement Training. Have a great day and please be safe out there.